Um, we have a, I think about just under an hour and 15 minutes, we have a very interesting panel looking at the future of warfare, looking at the future of warfare from a maritime perspective, but also in a way we're setting up the conversation after that very brilliant uh, speech. We're, we're going to be looking at technological changes, geopolitical changes, strategic and tactical changes. Um, you know, we have an age in which uh, between now and 2030, uh, shipping is supposed to grow by 50%. We have a middle class, global middle class, which will grow by 50% by 2030. Um, most of this, much of this will be happening in the Indo-Pacific, which uh, sets the UK up very well from Dhaka. Um, but we're not going it alone to the region. Uh, Asia is becoming the center uh, of, of the global economy. By 2050, it's said to account for uh, maybe 52% of global GDP. And it's going by sea. Um, BRI is very sexy. but its BRI is still going to be more expensive than ships, uh, both in containers uh, and also in commercial shipping. And of course, we see the rise of Mahanian precepts in the Indian Navy and the Chinese Navy. And we see the, the groupings like the quadrilaterals and the trilaterals now beginning to uh, divide and di diversify the region and all these different axes. Um, up with me on the panel, we have an extremely, um, I think, incredibly intelligent, and I'm awestruck by, uh, by them. I'll start, uh, forgive me, I'll start uh, perhaps uh, from going from this side, uh, Professor Patrick Porter, who's now at the University of Birmingham. I've long followed his work on almost every topic. Uh, Professor Porter is one of those individuals who, if you don't know his work, you need to look at it. Uh, he recently published an extremely good uh, piece in uh, international security on U.S. Uh, grand strategy. Uh, I found it very, very impressive and continue to see him as someone who is probably one of the uh, great strategic thinkers in this city. Um, coming uh, next to me is uh, Martin Murphy, who is at King's uh, College at the Corbett uh, Center for uh, Maritime Studies. Uh, like myself, UK and US dual citizen, uh, the special relationship side by side here. Someone who's written more than sift, uh, 60 books and monographs on uh, maritime things. And someone I think today who'll be looking at hybrid warfare. So I think to some extent we have um, technological changes, uh, we have hybrid warfare, so we're gonna have like some interchanging between that. And then uh, we will also, from uh, my right, Jochen Bittner, who I have not known before, who uh, is an extremely good journalist at Dieselt, but he's also a philosopher, and I, you can absolutely tell he's a philosopher if you read uh, his recent works in the New York Times on what is happening to the geopolitical order. He's going to talk today about uh, China, Russia, and the West, and how that... So I think, in some ways, he's kind of setting up uh, the big picture. I almost, uh, I'm not sure if there's a preferred order, but I almost think that if we start, you know, kind of 80,000 feet up, we might well start um, with some of the philosophical and geopolitical um, aspects of this and then move steadily to my left, if that's acceptable to the panel. So, um, Jochen, that kind of puts the pressure on you. Uh, I hand it over to you and please take it away. You have about 12 minutes uh, each, gentlemen. That's great. John, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Ruzi, for inviting me over. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I have to admit to a German in particular, it's always a cultural shock, always and always again, to see uh, British debates on security. I just went, when I saw the speech, uh, heard the speech by the Secretary of State, I first wondered um, what weapon systems could uh, the German Secretary of Defense praise? Um, and would she, even if she, we have those weapons in Germany, would she uh, allow herself uh, to give a speech like that? Because people like myself would um, immediately accuse her of bellicism and militarism. So um, this is another topic, of course, but it just sprang to my mind when I heard this brilliant lecture. What I wanted to do today is um, try to um, give you an impression of how I feel what we are going through at the moment uh, in a geopolitical sense, because I believe that the idea of a new Cold War uh, doesn't really match what we are seeing today. My, my impression is that uh, what we are witnessing on the global stage uh, uh, more resembles a, a new great game. And this was what I wanted to put to you. 
Um, why am I talking about a new great game? I think we are seeing uh, a new collision of great powers, quite similar to the collision that we saw in the 19th century. Um, it's about competition um, for spheres of influence, trying to roll back spheres of influence, but unlike the great game of the 19th century between the British and the Russian Empire, today's new great game is even more global, more complex, and I believe potentially more dangerous. Um, let me call the new great game the game of threes. The game of threes involves three prime players, Russia, China, and the West, and they are competing in three ways, geographically, intellectually, and economically. Also, there are three places uh, where the different claims to power clash, or clash most. Syria, Ukraine, and the Pacific. So the game of threes has uh, a threefold three dimension to it. Um, Coming to the, um, or starting off with the intellectual dimension of the game of threes. Um, what we are witnessing in, in the West today are, is, is a growing doubt uh, whether the post-war internationalism has been or will be the right way, the right way forward. And um, if the, um, the form of European integration and multilateralism um, is actually the most effective way of international governing. Now, to all those who, who doubt and dither about the right way forward, China and Russia stand ready as alternative models and protective powers, offering new arrangements for bilateral and multilateral alignments. In other words, if you don't want to follow international law, European integration, the painstaking a key communautaire, or anti-corruption schemes, why not just follow China and Russia? Take, take Egypt, for example. What will prove more attractive to the Egyptian government in the likely case of another mass uprising in the country? An alignment with Europe, which is annoyingly nervous about the respect for human rights, or an alignment with Russia, which has proven that it will look the other way in the face of domestic oppression, even if an ally uses chemical weapons against its own people. And what could this then potentially mean for, let's say, the Suez Canal fees? Now, while Russia offers military ruthlessness, China offers the mercantile variant, economic ruthlessness. Unlike the West, China doesn't let human rights and the rule of law get in the way of investments. Um, take Ukraine, for example. In late 2017, Beijing increased its investment in Ukraine, announcing it as an important building block in its new Silk Road to Europe. Now, the government in corruption-ridden Kiev has already gladly declared 2019 the Year of China, in, in uh, Ukraine, or take the Balkans. You could, as a prime minister of a Balkan state, wait endlessly, of course, for the European Union to let you enter the club um, by adhering to strict compliance standards and implementation of 800,000 pages of required laws. Or you could turn to Chinese investors, which many of those states increasingly do, who won't ask for any such fuss. Um, interestingly, in, in 2016, the president of China spent three days, three days on a state visit in Serbia. The year before, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel only spent a couple of hours there. Now, state-controlled Chinese companies have since bought Serbia's biggest steel mill. They have bought the Tirana International Airport in Albania. They have bought a major coal power plant in Romania and, of course, the harbor of Piraeus in Greece, to name but a few of its strategic acquisitions in Europe. 
Chinese foreign direct investments in Germany have jumped by 77% in 2016. Now, while China does not seem as driven by aggressive anti-Western sentiments as Russia does, Beijing and Moscow, of course, share one strategic goal, to reduce Western influence worldwide. China, if you want, delivers the money to bolster new alliances, while Russia delivers the political poison to weaken the old ones. And especially here in England, you know what I'm talking about. And now, just like during the 19th century great game, the Gremlin has the great advantage of not having to worry about public criticism at home when it pushes an illiberal agenda abroad. Quite on the contrary, actually. While applying military force tends to destabilize Western governments, it seems only to bolster the regime of Russia's President Vladimir Putin. If anything, the Russian population glories in the atrocity of its former leaders as well as those of the current one. According to a 2017 poll by the Levada Institute, 38% of Russians regard the mass murderer Joseph Stalin, the quote, most outstanding person in world history. Mr. Putin follows at 34%. There's where another intellectual dimension of the great game comes in. Societal self-criticism, which is alien to a large part of Russian society, is of course a defining feature of many Western countries. Um, now this, the strength of skepticism has of course made Europe great, but it can prove a weakness if it is exploited by a force that seeks the destruction of the very concept of truth. Um, and as a German, I can't resist the uh, comparison with Goethe's Faust, uh, because I believe that as an intellectual force, Russia is to Europe what Mephisto was to Faust, in a way, the spirit that steadily denies. Or to paraphrase Goethe, for all the West has built, should rightly to destruction run. This is why the Russian disinformation and its grotesque twisting of facts is so effective. Mr. Putin knows that Europeans deeply distrusts, distrust their governments in questions of war and peace, especially after some relied on Washington's twisted intelligence to justify the Iraq war. Now, the poison used on former Russian agent Sergei Skripal at Salisbury and the chemical weapons dropped with impunity on the children of Syria, did not only kill people. In consequence, this poison also killed trust in elected representatives in London, Paris, Paris, and Berlin. Because how can we be sure that it was the Russians who actually committed those crimes? Can you be completely sure? Of course you can't, but there's a great plausibility but this is what a growing number of people just don't buy into any longer. Sure, there's no doubt that the international community in the West has violated its own standards at times, conducting legally questionable or outright illegal actions in Kosovo, Iraq, and Syria. Yet Russia and China are perverting perverting the legal international system by using their power as permanent members of the Security Council to block justice and to undermine the West. So they don't even have the claim to use the system properly. Who will win the new great game in the long run? Of course, it is too soon to know whether the West is willing to stand up collectively to the challenge. The good news, though, is that Russia and China may yet lose at the new great game. It is expensive to play, and global power grabs um, tend, tend to falter, as the West itself has witnessed. 
But the, uh, the very idea that um, skepticism is our strength and that liberalism is a self purporting idea is what we have been thinking for decades, even centuries here in England. I still hope it is right, but I think we need a new assurance. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Jochen. Uh, yesterday I was on Twitter and there was a great Economist article that said 400 years of liberalism and when I clicked on it, it said URL not functioning. <laughs> and I wondered, have they been hacked deliberately? Um, I think the battle of ideas very much sets us up uh, for, for the day, but it also sets us up uh, neatly uh, for the next speaker, uh, Dr. Martin Murphy, who's going to talk about uh, hybrid warfare, which is in many ways psychological as well as it is physical. Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, hybrid war because I think if we think about hybrid warfare, it diverts us into issues of technology and TTP uh, rather too quickly. Hybrid war really has become a concept uh, without a boundary, or rather the boundary that it has is, is war itself. Now, that overlap does not make it redundant. Um, instead, it serves to remind uh, anyone who is listening that war is only limited by the political, social, and cultural understanding of its protagonists. Now, Clausewitz argued that war tends towards the extreme. Each side strives for escalatory dominance. Clausewitz was writing about a particular type of war, Napoleonic war, uh, from out of which he teased some universal principles. Now, escalation dominance for Clausewitz and, and Napoleon, his, his, his model, was the use of overwhelming violence on the battlefield. And the nuclear age, well, the first nuclear age anyway, uh, the search for escalatory dominance uh, mutated into deterrence. However, it is war's nature, like Machiavelli's met metaphorical flood, um, to spread by seeking uh, new directions and new weaknesses. Hybrid war links escalatory dominance to perception manipulation, spreading that search uh, beyond the conventional battlefield. Reflect for a moment on China's weaponization of its economy. Now, it exists in two essential forms, non-state and state, which have overlapping, if, if indeed common, uh, characteristics, maybe just differences of emphasis between the two. So looking first at the, the non-state version, I mean, hybrid warfare, the, con the, the idea, the, context, the concept, uh, arose in the context of uh, post-Cold War conflict between uh, non-state actors and states. The term was co coined by William Nemeth in his 2002 study of the Chechen War, which he, where he observed that the Chechens combined regular and irregular military methods on the battlefield with all means, as he called it, of the emerging information age, and a concept of war he called total because it drew no distinction between combatants and non-combatants. For another writer, John McEwen, hybrid meant simultaneous success on all fronts, so instead of following the sequential form of conventional warfare, like Nemeth, he saw no theoretical limit preventing uh, the use of every weapon up to and including acts of catastrophic terrorism. Remember that he was looking at this particular era. Finally, probably the most widely read writer on the topic, Frank Hoffman, uh, who has worked closely with Jim Mattis for over 20 years and came to hybrid warfare by studying the Hezbollah-Israeli uh, War of 1992, concluded hybrid threats meant the full range of conventional, unconventional, and terrorist acts and criminal disorder directed and coordinated to achieve physical and psychological effects. He admitted later that uh, that definition, his early definition, had undercooked the information and psychological dimensions. So now we come to, to state-centric hybrid warfare and the events that really awakened the recognition and the application of the term hybrid warfare has been Russians' actions in Crimea and the Ukraine. The description of those actions uh, by NATO, which caused some controversy at the time, and the rather belated application of the hybrid war label or hybrid, war, hybrid label to China's actions in the South and East China Seas. And the linkage 
between escalatory dominance and perception manipulation remains paramount and across the entire potential battle space. For Russell Glenn, another writer, any definition of hybridity that focused predominantly on the use of force and violence but underplayed the use of political, diplomatic and economic tools was turning a blind eye to the critical aspects of this form of war. Hence, a justifiable confusion as to whether we're fighting a great power war or not and why perception manipulation so often revolves around issues of legality. Now, the suggestion was made that hybrid wars added new rungs at the lower end of the escalatory ladder. Now, this, it strikes me, is, is misguided for two reasons. Hybrid war does not work on the assumption that military force is paramount or, and this is McEwen's point, that progress is linear. It's what word echoes Clausewitz. The aim of war is to compel our enemy to do our will, in this case, by whatever means necessary. State-centric warfare is at root a form of what used to be called political warfare, which was defined by George Kennan in 1948 as the employment of all means at a nation's command short of war to achieve its national objectives. More pithily, he described it as the logical application of Clausewitz's doctrine in times of peace. He included economic measures and information warfare, which he called propaganda and psychological operations, and admitted it could be violent though in his case he was rather limiting it to armed resistance movements. So what differences are there between political warfare and hybrid warfare, and how do they play out in the maritime domain? So starting again with non-state hybrid warfare, there are relatively few examples uh, in the maritime domain, but the migration of state-like military methods and capabilities to non-state actors has occurred as a model proposed by Nemeth predicted with Iran in particular as a prime mover. So Hezbollah's cruise missile attacks on the Hanit in 2006 naturally raised alarm bells. And more recently, the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen have fired missiles at the USS uh, Mason and a missile or drone at uh, a UAV high-speed vessel, both in 2016, and fired SCARD missiles at Saudi Arabia. Not particularly maritime, but just more evidence for the prosecution. When it comes to state-centric warfare, those constants of escalation dominance and perception manipulation uh, remain. But the particular differences, violence, actual or threatened, is more obviously part of the grammar of hybrid warfare than it is of political warfare. Most obvious, particularly in non-state versus state conflicts, for example, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Afghan Mujahideen. But also in Russian usage. Russia has demonstrated in Ukraine the willingness to use its proxies to pulse violence, using it when it advances objectives, pulling back when it hampers them, effectively to maintain a frozen conflict. China, to date at least, has been more subtle, threatening rather than using armed violence uh, to get its way. The armed threats it has made, it communicates using its paramilitary coast guard and maritime militia below the level of armed conflict, while at the same time it has made its military build-up obvious and the presence of the plan over the horizon clear. Russia, whilst it has a paramilitary sea-based border force, it has no real equivalent to these Chinese formations. A second difference is the use of deceptive conceptual and legal ambiguity. That's been key. China particularly has exploited the scene between the law enforcement ROE and the law of armed conflict, ROE, in part by manipulating the different meaning of law in China, and this applies equally to Russia, compared to that of its opponents. The operational aim overall, and again this applies to Russia as well as to China, has been and will continue to be to cloak aggression with legitimacy. China's aim is to achieve administrative control over sea areas, a concept that it claims as legal legitimacy under Chinese law, but as no grounding in international law. China's aims are similar to gain acceptance for a sphere of influence over its near abroad, which would most likely find naval expression in the Baltic. The third difference is the use of external aims categorized as internal aims. So China uses disinformation that proceeds through a long 
process of gradually escalating claims that describe a, a target, a reef, an island, uh, a seabed resource, a fishing ground to Taiwan as Chinese, establishes its claim by shaping perceptions which once established justifies its subsequent use or threat of use of force to protect what it now claims are its sovereign rights. Russia has a similar model when it comes to its relationship to its compatriots, its Russians now left overseas, and one could see the extension of that line of thought by China to its diaspora. Final difference is incrementalism. Hybrid warfare proceeds using a disrupt and hold cycle. Claim, observe, recalibrate, move on, or stand still and wait. So draw a few conclusions together briefly. Hybrid war is a war of perception shaped by deception. Its aim is to get inside and disrupt the opponent's decision space, not just his military decision cycle, but also its policy process. It works well against open societies with unmoderated information inputs. Social media makes it easy. It's not about preparing the battlefield, although it might come to that, but about enlarging the battle space. Countering this is hard. It's a war because China's aim is to replace the current world order with its own, starting at sea. Russia no longer has quite the same level of ambition. The Royal Navy and other European navies need to prepare for this fight, and not just in European waters, but also in East Asia, where the challenge and changes to the maritime order have been engineered by China affect us all. The Navy has a right to role, but that role could only be effective within a whole-of-government approach that begins by recognising and acknowledging what is happening and what is at stake. It's not to say that conventional military-centric uh, um, war is over. We must prepare for that. Or that our new focus on cyber is misplaced. It is not. But war will and is larger than either of these, and weakness invites um, uh, invites war, and we have plenty of those. Thank you. Thank you. As you were speaking, um, Dr. Murphy, I couldn't help but think of the East China Sea and how much of a, a tension that was with hybrid warfare with fishing fleets. And I wonder if the 2015 US-Japan uh, defense guidelines which reacted to that type of level of hybridization might be a useful case study for us all in a kind of whole of government, cross service, and very standing committee-ish style approach towards these areas where we're seeing incremental um, digging away of the, geo of the strategic space. Professor Porter, um, we now come to you, and I, I, I hand over the uh, mic to you, please. Thank you very much, John. Well, my goodness me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the privilege of being here. Uh, could I say how lovely you all look as well in these uniforms? It's a real privilege to watch you from this vantage point. You've asked me to talk about the future of war, and forgive me for saying so, but the thing about the future is that it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and before that sounds too banal, there are quite a lot of my colleagues in political science and there are quite a lot of people in the field of big data and some people in the military world who talk about the future as though it's already happened and we just have to get better at forecasting it, get more agile at reacting to it and make the right choices now. But surely for a middle power or a major power like Britain, and I think Britain is still a major power, uh, it has a large stake in shaping that future, in exercising discretion, in choosing what kinds of wars are worth bleeding for and in fact, at the grand strategic level, defining what interests are worth fighting for in the first place. So I want to take you actually back in time to another place entirely where there was another debate about future war in Baghdad, in the Ba'at regime, in about 2002 and 2001, when Saddam Hussein and his chiefs internally discussed what would happen if the Americans came. How could they best defend themselves if the Americans made good on their threats. Not something Saddam ever took entirely seriously, by the way. A number of his officers argued that the only way they could seriously mount a fight against the greatest superpower the world has ever seen would be to fight them in the big city, to turn Baghdad into a fortress, to use their own urban environment to negate 
the advantages of mobility, of manoeuvre, of firepower, of precision, and to bleed this invader, and to scorch the earth, to destroy the bridges, burn the oil fields, flood the dams. Uh, probably they knew if this happened, they would probably go down, but they could at least inflict a dying sting. In fact, a lot of the prophecies made by anti-war campaigners that this, this, in fact, would happen, could have happened had they made that choice. But Saddam refused. He refused even to entertain the idea of developing a doctrine of urban combat. Why? Because he was more frightened of his own army, the own, his own heavy infantry and armoured units, and he was too frightened of putting them too close to the seat of government in Baghdad. The military efficiency of his own forces was actually a threat to him, he believed better to keep them further afield, even in areas where they might be more easily fixed, found and annihilated, and defend Baghdad only with paramilitary forces. You know what happened. Baghdad fell within weeks, the paramilitary forces were gunned down. In other words, a much weaker power still had a major say in the kind of war we, our countries, found ourselves fighting. I do say we because I became a citizen a few years ago, so I'm allowed to say it. Uh, how much like Saddam have we been in this regard? Saddam never took the American invasion seriously. He didn't think they had the stomach for it. He went on as though the world was still the place it was on September the 10th, 2001. He distributed videos to his officers, the Battle of uh, Somalia, saying, look how weak they are whenever they get any resistance, even from pagans. But I think in a way, less dramatically, our countries have committed a similar error in thinking about the future, in refusing to take Russia seriously as a geopolitical player. I think we too have been subject to wishful thinking in thinking about the future in the recent past. If you look at SDSR 2010, at that time when this country was trying to restore creditworthiness, cutting expenditure, looking what what fat could be trimmed. Uh, there was a, set, a sense in which they were, the decision makers were mistaking wishes for facts. It may have been true that Britain needed to make cuts to make itself through austerity more leaner and agile, but the error was to assume that the world and the major powers would cooperate. The error was to ignore many warnings, in fact, that the world was going to return to a state which it now is in, one of competitive multipolarity, competitive multipolarity. People who said this might happen were either ignored, a colleague of mine wrote an article about Russia's revanchism and it's near abroad and was told this was outmoded rail politic, 2008, just before Georgia. Arag was quietly dispatched in the night on the basis that the real action was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan and the future looked like the present one of uh, armed, expeditionary, ambitious, long-term, nation-building, nation-fixing, counter-terrorism, light, imperial constabulary. And th yet the warnings were there, also from Russia. Sergei Lavrov, Vladimir Putin, announcing many times they regarded even the discussion about NATO expansion as a direct threat to Russia's interests. Uh, highly provocative military exercises with rehearsing first-use nuclear strikes on Warsaw, the Zapad exercises, um, again and again um, signs of increasing gradual escalation, the highest number of submarine hostile military contacts since 1987. And yet SDSR 2010, the document, mentions Russia twice, once in the context of general security dialogue, once in the context of energy security. So there's a sense in which it's not necessarily what happens, comes to us is a black swan the causes of strategic shock are not usually things that are wildly improbable. It's not usually those. It's our prior disbelief in the possibility that things we don't want to happen may actually happen. One of the most dangerous ideas, I think, that floats around in these kind of debates and it's talking about the future is the suggestion that we have, quote, no choice. A very bright American officer once said to me, you don't understand. This country doesn't get to choose the wars it fights. And I said, yes, it does, actually. That's the thing about being a continental-sized, nuclear-armed, rich, maritime-shielded, air-army, Premier League-forced 
type power, that's the thing, it does actually afford discretion. The war on terror did not have to lead to Baghdad, just as the Arab Spring did not have to lead this country into Tripoli. And the choices we make now are the ones that shape us in the future. And for better or worse, and I think for worse, there was a cost, a price to be paid, for a decade of investing in the kind of expeditionary effort to fix broken states, that does come at a price. Things like anti-submarine warfare, things like air defence, things like combined uh, heavy metal manoeuvre at scale. And we need to think carefully about what kind of force we want to create. And there's no way out of that dilemma. Saying we want a balanced force is also coming at a price, because a balanced force, a pentathlete, also comes at a cost, because pentathletes are not usually gold win medal win winners in any one event. They, are, they, are, they, have, they sacrifice excellence for breadth, and they lose weight and specialism and sustainability. Uh, lastly, as we sort of unpack this and think about the choices for the future, and I guess I should turn to a more nautical maritime metaphor. This is from the late A. A. Gill. Um, he invites us to imagine we're at, we, we wake up one day on a boat alone, far out at sea, not knowing where the hell we are or how we got there. And on the horizon, two boats are coming towards us, and we can only stop one of them. In one of them, there's a man with all the stuff you might want, a map, food, water, directions to land. In the other boat, there's just a man who can tell you how you got there in the first place, but you have to choose one. My worry with these kind of events is that people often jump to the boat with all the solutions in it, with all the supplies, and not the boat that actually tries to comprehend how we got here in the first place. And like Saddam, and like us thinking about Russia in the future, I'm a bit worried we're not picking the right boat. The end.